Hello, everyone. Welcome to Buddhist Center. It's so lovely to be with you this evening to talk about the stages of the path to enlightenment, to talk about the thing that we can do with our minds so that we don't have to experience so much suffering and then eventually we'll never have to experience suffering again. And if we do this right, if we not only have a desire to definitely emerge from cyclic existence, but it's combined with bodhicitta and we've entered the Mahayana, the place we arrive at is not only free from suffering, but goes from bliss to bliss to bliss to bliss uh, and is abiding in a state of perfect love and compassion, perfect power, per perfect skillful means, perfect wisdom. And this is only achieved by removing the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience. Uh, and Matre is uh, middle beyond extremes. We find this, there's two problems. We have afflictive obstructions and obstructions to omniscience and the abandonment of those is what allows us to achieve that state of Buddhahood which if we all were really honest at this very moment and someone said to us, uh, do you want to be free from suffering? We would say, yes, <laughs> we want to be free from suffering. And then they'd ask, well, do you want to be, is it okay to have a little or do you want to be completely free? So everyone would honestly answer, I don't want any suffering. Suffering of any sort uh, is not something I like. And then if you were to be asked, do you want to have the most amount of happiness you could ever have, the most blissful state that you could ever achieve, would you want that? Uh, and the answer we would most likely say is yes. And the beauty of the Buddhist path, this path that eventually all these vehicles eventually lead into, trickle into one vehicle. And and that's the vehicle of the Mahayana, which shows us how to achieve those things I just mentioned. And we're so fortunate that we had these kind teachers that came into our world. We have His Holiness the Dalai Lama in our world. We had Kensar Geshe Wanda Rinpoche in our world and Geshe Lobsang Gompo Rinpoche in our world. And, and now we have Geshe Dorje Damdula and Umzala Aga guiding us so clearly along the pathway in each of our own individual ways that allows us to arrive at that state that we will all arrive at because the Buddhas are working day and night uh, and they're all around us. We just don't see them. They're working day and night for our needs, for our specific needs. And they've got this whole pharmacy as Guy Newland talks about that they have, you know, in terms of medicines to give us to make us get a little more well and then a little more well and then a little more well. Uh, but eventually we'll arrive at the healthiest state uh, and the healthiest state is the state of Buddhahood, where we no longer not only have the afflictive obstructions, but the obstructions to omniscience are gone. And what that means is, is that we have omniscience. And what that means is, is that even the subtle self-cherishing attitude is abandoned. And if we are in an abiding nirvana, if we're in a hearer, solitary realizer, abiding nirvana, uh, then we still have a subtle self-cherishing attitude. And that's all mixed in with the kind of stains, the the, the latent stains of the afflictive obstructions. Uh, and if one invites, if one engages in a path that isn't for the sake of everyone, and if one abides in a path only for oneself to achieve an abiding nirvana, then unfortunately it leaves with it, you know, while you're abiding there because you sought your own individual liberation solely, what's left over is this stain that's just a haze over our abilities. You can be free completely from suffering, uh, but you'll be missing the real, real gift uh, that Buddha came to give us. And that was our perfect reliability for everyone. That would then, if we became this perfectly reliable guide, uh, we would abide in bliss. We would be the one that is gone to bliss and that bliss would not have an end. Samsara has no beginning no beginning, but has an end. And nirvana, uh, the Buddha's nirvana, the non-abiding nirvana of a Buddha, has a beginning, but has no end. So we're so fortunate that we have a recipe that will allow us to get to that state. Uh, so before I go any further and talk about exactly what we need to do uh, in order to achieve that state, uh, let's begin by starting to set the proper motivation. And I'll recite something uh, which we recite every time before the teaching, which is an aspiration that I'm making uh, to be able to be heard in the language of all beings. The Buddha has this quality of speech, the 60 melodious rhythms of speech, the ability to answer all sentient beings' questions 
uh, simultaneously with one response and they'll hear the answer that they need in their own individual languages. And that answer will be an answer that will move them closer to Buddhahood. And this is the beauty of all of the teachings of Buddha. The Buddha is an omniscient being. So the Buddha came and gave a variety of different teachings for a variety of different beings. And all of these teachings were for one purpose and one purpose only for that individual being to be able to move closer to the point where he or she is a Buddha. Uh, and this is what the Buddha came to share with us. And the Buddha did not want us to be satisfied with kind of impartial results when we have this potential to have the most incredible mind in the universe. Uh, so part of the deal of this incredible mind that we have, part of the wisdom, uh, Dharmakaya's omniscience, is that uh, one is able to, based on the these qualities, you know, one of the qualities is caring for others of the wisdom Dharmakaya, uh, this perfect, perfect love and compassion for others, uh, and the understanding of reality and diversity of conventional and ultimate truth simultaneously. Uh, so this Buddha it has these qualities of loving and caring for others. And based upon that, they emanate various bodies from the Dharmakaya. They emanate the enjoyment bodies and speak in the language of the Arya Bodhisattvas until everyone's a Buddha. And they abide there in Ogmin and teach that in, the, in the, all of the languages, the Sanskrit language uh, that these Arya Bodhisattvas uh, can learn in and learn to progress through their stages of Bodhisattva grounds and remove more and more of the innate uh, afflictions to the point where their stains aren't even there uh, any longer. Uh, so not only can a Buddha do that, go to real special folks who've realized emptiness and are bodhisattvas who've realized emptiness, but then the Buddha also appears in whatever form he or she ne needs to in order to help proliferate mature sentient beings. Uh, and in order to do that, if the Buddha's object of observation of his or her love and compassion uh, is all sentient beings, all sentient beings don't speak the same language. And the beauty of the Buddha's body is that the Buddha can emanate a body for every single sentient being in the universe. And the line between sentient being uh, and non-sentient being is the 10th Bodhisattva ground. Everyone below the 10th Bodhisattva ground is a sentient being. Everybody who's past the 10th Bodhisattva ground uh, is no longer uh, a sentient being. So there's a whole lot of beings to mature. And the, the, the king of aspiration prayer is one of the most beautiful parts. It says that sentient beings are uncount hard, uncountable. You know, there's a number that's just so big, we can't count it. And likewise, karma and afflictions are uncountable. So when we think about it, if we've got a sentient being that has countless karma and afflictions, and we have countless, you know, sentient beings, uh, then we have a lot of math to do. <laughs> and we're looking for our aspirations and our prayers to reach that kind of level, to reach a level where we would be able to help each and every individual sentient being with their uncountable karma and afflictions, to figure out how to remove that which gives rise to that inappropriate attention, afflictions, contaminated karmas, and then samsara. Um, so let's make these aspirations that we can start to have these qualities so that we leave imprints within our mind to connect ourselves with more teachings that will help us to ripen our proliferating Buddha nature. We all have good qualities of our mind that can mature to the peak of perfection because our mind is empty of inherent existence. When we look at our Buddha nature and we look at our ultimate Buddha nature, sometimes it's misinterpreted as something that is a positive phenomenon. But here, the ultimate Buddha nature is the emptiness of inherent existence of the mind this ability for the mind to mature because it isn't fixed, it's, it's not sullied, it's in the nature of clear light and unsullied. These stains that are within the mind are adventitious and they merely need to be separated out of this mind that isn't in the nature of being screwed up. Uh, and if it was in the nature of being screwed up and it was inherently screwed up, uh, then we couldn't do anything about it. And I'd be just talking for the sake of talking. But the beautiful part is, is that our mind is in the nature of clear light and unsullied and these stains can be removed. The afflictive obstructions that keep us from achieving nirvana, that keep us in samsara can be removed and the obstructions to omniscience that keep us from bliss, keep us from perfect love, compassion, skillful means, power, wisdom 
keep us from being the most reliable guides in the universe that the Buddha transformed into. When we look at that incredible Dignaga verse, the one from the uh, Pramana Samuchaya, the one who transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher with a capital T, Sugata, the one gone to bliss, our protector, to you I make prostrations. Uh, so this is the, when we make prostrations to a Buddha, it's like saying, you're my hero, and I'm going to become exactly like you. When we look at a lot of our heroes, they're role models. They're not people that we can achieve the same exact results they've achieved. We all have separate continuums, but Buddha Shakyamuni previously was just like us. And knowing that, Buddha came to let us know what to do with minds like ours, because Buddha had a mind just like ours, full of all of these defilements, the afflictive obstructions, the obstructions to omniscience. And he discovered a truth. He didn't make up a truth. He discovered a truth which would allow one to no longer have to have any of the things that nobody wants. So let's imagine, as I recite this, uh, that we're bringing sentient beings here and we're inviting them in their own individual languages. Normally, when we get something that's precious, we lock it up in a safe and we don't want to share it. Here, we're getting the most important thing in the universe handed to us, and we're going to learn to take the most important things and share them with others. And eventually, as it, it says in Illuminating the Intent, Lama Tsongkhapa's Umagumbarapsa, the commentary on the Majjhimika Avatara, we'll have so much patience that as we're being tortured and wishing that it was going slowly and cutting pizza, pieces of our flesh off bit by bit, uh, and they're being given away, this suffering we experience actually creates more compassion than one could ever imagine in our own little limited understanding. And that compassion creates a joy, actually, in the Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva knows that there's a way that he or she can make that torturer never have to suffer again and recognizes that that torture is under the sway of karma and afflictions and is out of control. And if we saw somebody that we love so, so greatly, so incredibly, you know, maybe they have some sort of kind of a brain problem and they start to act funny uh, or, you know, they, they, they have some kind of, you know, deficit that occurs. We are quickly and ready to be compassionate and understanding. Uh, because we care about them. And what we're trying to do is, is convince our minds that it makes more sense to cherish others than ourselves. And the only way we can convince our minds of such a thing, because our minds don't operate like that. It says in the seven point thought transformation by Geshe Chikawa, banish the one to blame for everything. And we, a lot of times it's, it's looked at as the self-cherishing attitude. And it is a problem but the thing to blame for everything is the self-grasping ignorance, because we can't say that the self-cherishing attitude is necessarily an affliction. So we'll leave this at that, because you couldn't have an abiding nirvana and still have subtle self-cherishing attitude, because the afflictions are all removed uh, for a, a faux destroyer here, a solitary realizer. But that's up for debate. But that's my story and I'm sticking to it tonight. So let's invite all of these beings. Let's share this precious gift with them. Let's think about the meditations that we do, hopefully on a daily basis, like the seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment and the pre-step of equanimity. And let's focus on the equalizing, exchanging self with others practice and the combination of both of those together generating this equanimity and recognizing the kind of sameness, the willingness to benefit friends, enemies, and neutrals equally. And then this recognition that all beings have been our mother and remembering their kindness and then making a resolution to repay that kindness, this kind of attitude where I will take on myself to repay their kindness. And then we kind of could table that idea for a moment and then move over to the actual equalizing and exchanging self with others practice to combine it and then say, all sentient beings are equally as important as I am. Look at the downfalls of the self-cherishing attitude and the benefits of cherishing others. And then begin to learn how to take on others suffering and give them complete happiness and eventually be able to put their needs before your own, to do that switch, to do that exchange where you cherish others the way that you cherish yourself that exchange that takes place 
through a cognitive transformation through these meditations, compassion, great compassion, all of these things are great things to talk about, but they will not just spontaneously arise. They have to be provoked. We have little bits and pieces of them, of them to work with. We know a little bit about them and we've had experiences of love and compassion and actually putting others' needs before our own at times. So we have some little experience with that. So the fact is, is that our minds have this goodness. It's just not good enough. And we make it gooder. <laughs> we make it better by doing these practices. And we come to this realization that putting others' needs before our own makes the most logical sense and makes the most sense for me and for you. If I want to help myself and help you, the most sense I can make out of the situation based on this meditation that I've done and this cognitive transformation that takes place from combining these things is that I should put others' needs before your own, my own, and recognize then next, just to kind of solidify it, the incredible kindness that those sentient beings throughout the universe have shown us. All these beings who we don't even know the names of, these strangers, these beings who are, you know, working in packaging facilities and working in countries where our coffee is made and work making boxes to have all these things put in and making cloths so that I can have a blanket. All of these sentient beings I don't even know the name of, but all of my happiness, all of my comfort, my enjoyments that I have all around me are dependent upon other sentient beings than myself. And I wouldn't have any of these things if. Uh, if there weren't for all these strangers. When we look at the meditation of the seven point cause and effect and we see all sentient beings as our mothers, we're using a, a much more limited scope of understanding of why the great kindness is provoked within our mind of all sentient beings. When we start to look at friends, enemies, and neutrals in their varying degrees of benefit to us, then we're looking at all sentient beings and able to, being able to establish them as beings that we should uh, want to kind of put their needs before our own. And we should want to take on ourselves the task of freeing them all, take on ourselves the task of bringing them to a state of Buddhahood. So we start to, in the, in the equalizing, exchanging self with others practice, our minds become even stronger and more convinced of the kindness of others because we recognize that, yes, those loved ones of ours have been very kind to us, but limited kindness they can really give to us. Strangers can give us such amazing amounts of kindness. Like Geshe Dorje Damdu said, uh, the pen you have, your mother could never harvest all of the things necessary, you know, and you know, how much would it cost to make one pen? You know, it takes all of these strangers in order for us to have just a pen, just one piece of paper. I always joke and say, Lorinda, person that I love more than anyone on this planet, uh, couldn't make me even a piece of paper, uh, let alone uh, bring me to a state of complete happiness, but couldn't even make me a piece of paper. Couldn't, couldn't cut down the tree or wouldn't even begin to know like how to get the log out of the, the woods and then make it into like in some sort of, you know, refining process that supposedly very pollutes the environment a lot. And then someone's got to clean up the environment so I can breathe. <laughs> Lorinda could never do all those things for me, but strangers do. I would try. I would try. Yeah, I know you would try, but strangers do. And then when we look at our enemies, who points out to us our defects? Who points out to us when we think that we're the top of the world and, you know, we should be, you know, maybe they should write a book about us, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and how kind we are, you know, the kindness of Jeff. Uh, and it, the kindness of Jeff, once it's tested by somebody uh, who uh, is, you know, not an enemy, you know, like grave enemies. I'm not like a superhero where I have this, you know, like Lex Luthor <laughs> that's coming after me. But I notice when people say things that I don't like or don't agree with. Or, you know, just depending on if my, my, my introspection or my kind of alertness has slipped a little bit, I can very easily find my mind disturbed in such a way that I would claim to myself at other times that it couldn't be. So it's somebody who's difficult that's going to be able to show me my mind and show me that I haven't done enough work. 
And it's not until I'm at that place where someone could be torturing me and I would just generate compassion for them. And, and, and if I thought in some way it would help them, I would kindly give my flesh like Buddha Shakyamuni did when he gave his flesh to the tiger cubs and the mama tigress who became his first students when he was a bodhisattva in previous life. So we see our minds can develop to this point that we couldn't even imagine, but our minds will not develop to a point that we cannot imagine if we don't put in the work. And if we don't allow ourselves to be honest, if we don't say, hey, that person just irritated me. And we just say, oh, it's just, you know, sometimes we, you know, put ourselves above others in a way to make ourselves not feel the pain of their annoyance. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing either. So Buddhism, the path, and we're going to talk about this tonight if I get to it, uh, is about checking our minds, seeing what our mind's doing telling our minds what to do for the first time. When we look at Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment, we have the four categories, the greatness of the teaching, the greatness of the author, how to listen to and explain the teachings, and then how to lead students through the actual instructions. When you get to the first, first point of how you lead students through the actual instructions, and you get to the first topic of reliance on a spiritual teacher, the next section tells us how to meditate and the faults of meditation. And it tells us, okay, practice these six preparations, you're sitting down, now tell your mind what to do. And we're our minds aren't used to being told what to do. Our minds just do, and then we react with our body and our speech. And we're learning how to train in the footsteps, as it says in the, the King of Aspiration prayers, train in the footsteps of the victorious Buddhas and bring all good actions to perfection. This means that our good actions, our good deeds, our good virtues, the virtues in our minds that are weak can be brought to perfection. And the negative things in our mind that are strong can be wiped out. May my moral conduct be taintless and pure, never lapsing and always be free from fault. And we can see how the scale, you know, right now we have a lot more disturbing emotions. And, you know, it says in Shantideva, a virtuous thought rarely ever comes like a flash of lightning in the dark you know and we have such this overpowering emotions and negativities that at any moment can just throw us off track and it's just bodhicitta that's able to fight those things that's the mike you know the mike tyson you know boxing a small child if we can get bodhicitta it's like an atomic bomb it's like the fire at the end of an eon as shanti davis says that allows us to destroy those negativities that are so much more prevalent in our mind than those good qualities that I say, and I claim because Buddha claims it, and I believe Buddha can be matured to perfection. So in the language of the gods, nagas and yaksas, in the language of demons and of humans too, and however many kinds of speech there may be, I shall proclaim the Dharma in the language of all. La yi ge dan le dan no jin ge ru bon da dan mi yi ge nan dan dro wa gon ji jan an ji zan ba tan che ke du da ji chu den do. So imagining you brought all sentient beings here based on this meditation. So we're talking about the meditation. So we arrived at this great kindness that others show us. So now we've said, I'm going to take upon myself the task of bringing all sentient beings to a state of happiness and taking them to a state where there's never have to suffer again, just letting them get out of samsara, but the way that they do it, we show them how to do it in a way that makes them become a Buddha. So we say, I'm going to take it on myself, the task of bringing all these beings to this great state. And then we recognize our own handicapped. We recognize at this final step, whether we're combining the practices uh, or not, that I'm handicapped. I don't have perfect love, power, compassion, skillful means, and wisdom. I have such gross self-cherishing attitude, let alone the subtle cherish, self-cherishing attitude. My self-grasping ignorance just leads me to inappropriate attention, afflictions, contaminated karmas, and samsara. How could I be laying on the ground next to someone else laying on the ground with all of our bones broken and help them up? How could I be in a pit you know, that's so, so deep with someone else and then get us out of there. I need to be out of the pit to be able to reach down, to be able to help. 
So I recognize at the conclusion of these bodhicitta meditations that I must become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. And when we do this enough, one day, a spontaneous kind of thought will arise that will just stay there. As long as we don't screw it up in the medium at the small level of the path of accumulation, it's the only place where we can screw it up. As soon as we get to the medium level of the path of accumulations, most scholars agree that you cannot lose your bodhicitta. So one day we'll generate this mind that day and night we'll want to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. In Lama Tsongkhapa's Three Principal Paths, we see the definition of renunciation is day and night seeking transcendent liberation, not thinking of anything else but getting out of samsara. And that's the foundation for not thinking about anything else but getting to the state of Buddhahood and bringing all sentient beings there. So this is what we're doing. This is why we're calling all hell, hell beings, the eight hells, the eight hot hells, the eight cold hells, the surrounding hells, all of the hungry ghosts. They're struggling and starving and just keep seeing mirages of food and water that can't nourish them, that just turn into hot things and little tiny mouths that nothing can fit in to satiate their humongous bellies that are just the size of mountains. And we think about these states and the state that we're in, and the only difference is, is that we haven't stopped breathing because we have enough karma right now within our beginningless continuum to be born millions of times with this kind of body that can never be satiated. And it will abide for what a timeline that we can't even imagine. And this all sounds maybe like a fairy tale when we read about it. But as I've said so many times, when we look at even the animal realm and we look at a hundred years ago before people had the internet and people didn't have the Encyclopedia Britannica, if you went somewhere and spoke of the kind of creatures that are findable in the rainforest, someone would say, nah, I don't believe that. Or, you know, would just say, no way, that's not possible. That can't be true. You know, uh, I've never seen that with my eyes. And the I've never seen that with my eyes is the nihilist reason for saying there's no past lives in some of the nihilist traditions. It's saying nothing matters. You could do anything you want in this life. I can't see it. So please try to make your mind a little open because we see we have to in Arya Deva's 400 verses, the qualities of the student. We want to be open minded, intelligent and put in effort. This open-mindedness is so necessary to not come to the teaching with all these preconceived notions of this or that, because when we do that, we're not hearing anything. And we want to be free of the, the three pots that we talked about last night, last week, and we talk about all of the time, the up, overturned pot, the pot with a hole in it, and the pot that's full of feces or poison, what, you know, however graphic you want to make the pot that you walk in with that has all these kind of bad ideas that mix in and don't allow you to hear the teaching in a pure way. So with that being said, bring all of these beings here because you know that by doing so, you're leaving imprints in your mind to be able to ripen into higher and higher states of fulfillment of all of your needs and all sentient beings needs. Because all we need as sentient beings are Buddhas. We don't, we think we need other stuff. Obviously we need to eat and we need to drink, but more importantly, if we can figure out how to end samsara, we don't have to be hungry again. So there's a bigger kind of idea that we can have. And if we can become Buddhas, then we can show everybody in the universe exactly what they need to know to evolve. And this is what's so beautiful about the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha wandered around sometimes, talked to this person and that person, talked to this person maybe in Sanskrit, talked to this person maybe in the, the language of the, the, I forget the name, the, the language, Mugda, Mugada, Mugda, Mugad, Mugd, anyway, of the kind of area he was in in India, you know, and maybe, you know, somehow, you know, going to other realms and speaking other languages and, 
you know, even seeing the Heart Sutra, the Heart Sutra was taught and everyone who was there heard different things. Some heard 100,000 verse, some heard 20,000 verse, some heard 8,000 verse, some heard this little Heart Sutra, some heard Ah, and all of them were able to understand the five past 10 grounds and the, the explicit teaching of the lack of inherent existence of all phenomena. So we need to keep an open mind. Uh, don't try to use history to prove Buddhism, use philosophy to prove Buddhism. We were just having a big talk about this. You know, look at the philosophy and see for your own mind what makes sense. And if you can go through the tenets of Vibhashka, Sautrantika, Chitta Mantra, and Madhyamaka, you're able to get on that staircase to go to emptiness that will be necessary because we all hold these kind of subtle views we don't even know that we hold. And if you go right to Madhyamaka, then you're fooling yourself because you won't necessarily know the object of negation because there will be subtler things that you previously didn't learn and you will oversimplify projection, naming, basis of designation and nothing from the side of the object. I can say that so easily, but without it recognizing what the actual object of negation, inherent existence is, would be, could be like true establishment, true existence, existing right within the object, what that would be like, what it would have to be, it would have to exist, you know, in some way that was one with its parts or separate from its parts. Uh, and that unfindability leads us to a lack of inherent existence. So we see that philosophy is what we should use as our bar to what's truth or not truth. And if one philosophy is able to disprove another philosophy, then for our own being, then that becomes the accurate philosophy. So we have to always be trying to climb that staircase, but not say that it's all good and every view is good. We have to analyze it because the Buddha said to cut and rub it. The Buddha said, don't trust everything I said. And you shouldn't because the Buddha said some things that were incomplete. The Buddha first taught the selflessness of person uh, and, and said, you know, didn't teach the selflessness of phenomena. He taught that phenomena is empty of having self of person, but he didn't teach the emptiness of self of person and emptiness of phenomena. And if you leave something from the side of the object, like is done in all schools all the way up, you know, whether you're in, you know, Vaibhashika or Sautrantika, you know, following scripture or following reason or Chitta Mantra and following scripture or reason or true aspectarians or false aspectarians, you know, you're, or the, you know, the middle way autonomy school, whether it's the autonomy, the it's like Chitta Mantra, the Yogacara autonomy school, or the, the, Sautra, the one that's like Sautrantika autonomy school, there's all stuff left from the side of an object that is not right. And we have to be able to see what those views are. I mean, I guarantee I could give a Chitta Mantra teaching tonight. And, and if I did it skillfully enough, you would not know it's not Madhyamaka Prasangika view. So we've got to be really, really careful to see if we know what we think we know. And the only way we can do that is to study, to have the wisdom arisen from hearing and then the wisdom arisen from analysis. If we don't hear, we have nothing to analyze. If we have nothing to analyze, we'll never see emptiness. We'll never ever wear that generic image down, this mistaken idea down that will, to the point, where we'll be able to cut through it and have a yogic direct perception of emptiness. So bring all these beings here with this in mind that we're gonna do something really special here tonight and we're gonna bring the merit field here tonight and you want every being in the universe to be able to experience that because you're learning to share. You're learning to do what we were taught to do in kindergarten and then just forgot altogether and became very like, you know, all about ourselves, all about money, all about pleasure, all about fame, all about being happy, all about feeling good, all about not not feeling good, all about hearing nice things in our ear and not wanting to hear bad things in our ear. Really, really, we just came became convinced that cherishing ourselves more than others uh, was the key to our happiness. And someone told us when we were very, very young that it wasn't and that we could have more friends if we could share and then when you have more friends, you feel better if there's a genuine kind of sharing and caring that's there, you feel better. So we can see that the Buddha really knew uh, what he was talking about. And this is why this is valuable enough to invite every being in the universe to hear. All the hell beings, all the hungry ghosts, all of the animals in the sea and on the earth and in the sky, all of those 
all of those beings in the gods realms that think that they're experiencing a bliss that's never going to end and surprise all of these flowers start to wilt and they start to smell and all of these companions that they were get kind of jiving off of and feeling so good to be around all leave them because they don't like that stench and they don't like to see that kind of things in the gods realm and then that poor god sees oh my i've used up so much good karma to hell i go to the lowest hell i go and when you read about the sufferings that we ex can experience and that our minds can can project collectively in a place wow we don't like suffering now why would we ever engage in non-virtue if we could experience something like that this is we have to convince ourselves of and the gods you know if we keep nice stuff all around us and just want to have nice stuff all the time and we're really virtuous and really ethical we might be born in that state and that's no good or if we're really really generous and not ethical we'll be born a dog with like a really like our dogs <laughs> really really like hooked up dogs but dogs so we we really should take heed of these words if we don't want when we read about these realms if they do exist if we don't want that to happen to us uh we see what could happen animals and, and humans if we believe in you know past and future lives those are in our eyes uh keep an open mind you know these gods you know who are experiencing this uh all of these happinesses uh, and the gods below them, these demigods that are just not quite as good, that are always so jealous of them. Think about the levels of jealousy that you can have to have had in life because somebody has something that you think that you should have. Think about that level of jealousy. Well, be it, you know, engage in some good things, some virtues, but have that kind of an idea still in your mind. And you'll be born as a demigod where you're just dissatisfied with your state because you know there's one better, <laughs> but you're still a god, which is so strange. It's still a god, it's a god's realm. If you look at Basu Bandhu's, you know, five realms instead of six realms. It's really amazing to see that that falls into that. Uh, and then we could be born into a, a form realm or a formless realm and abide there, just, you know, move our way up the concentration grasping ladder the you know first four concentration levels and then make our way of the form realm and then make our way up the next four of the formless realm you know but eventually that will run out and we'll have to then experience our a non-state of that single pointed kind of concentration that feels so good and buddha's final two teachers uh, uh alara kalam and udrika both thought they had it they thought we got it we got nirvana we've got the liberation and Buddha knew they were missing something. And what they were missing was the, the actual liberating path, the, the, the abandonment of the self-grasping ignorance. And just concentration alone will suppress. But just like, uh, you know, Dharmakirti says that, you know, just eliminating, you know, a desire for something by thinking that it's, you know, really bad and suppressing it. Uh, won't get rid of it because you haven't gotten rid of the root. And it'll be just like moving, you know, from one one partner onto another partner you've decided this partner is horrible and you know so now you've not no longer attachment to this partner but now you have attachment to a new partner why because just that didn't get rid of attachment altogether that just quelled it or suppressed it in a one given circumstance and your mind's ready because of seeing everything is inherently existent from a grasping perspective and from an appearance perspective uh, one will live to fight another day of aversion and attachment and pride and all of these things that cause a disturbance of our mind that just is why we're not happy. Uh, so we bring all of these beings here and we imagine that they're shaken out of their state for a moment to be able to hear this dharma and to recognize that, oh, I haven't achieved what I need to achieve and I could become perfect and everyone I've ever cared about, if they could see their past lives, I could help them. And they would want to, if we weren't so blind and we could see our past lives and we could recognize those beings that walk up to us, uh, cared about us so much, like Pabunka Rinpoche, Dorje Chang says, that we would come upon a, a worm maybe or a bug and, and be able to say, mother, you've been so kind to me and really feel that, not have to invoke it. These things, these steps in the bodhicitta practice become spontaneous things that arise before bodhicitta arises. So recognize that too. 
and you can judge your practice to see how spontaneous the arisal of equanimity is. How spontaneous is it that you recognize beings as your mother? How spontaneous is it that you think all beings are equally as important as you? All beings wish to have happiness and don't want to have suffering, just like you. All beings are empty of inherent existence. Self is positive independence upon other, other independence upon self. Other is thinking they're themselves and then they're your other and you're thinking other is someone else and yourself. So these, both of these things are dependent upon perspectives and are empty of inherent existence. We all have Buddha nature. Everybody has this potential to be perfect. And whoever I find distasteful might be my only savior because they may become a Buddha before I and become the most reliable guide in the universe. And because of my connection to them, they're the ones who can then connect with me in a specific moment. This is the weird part. The Buddhas are omniscient and can emanate all these bodies, but they have connections in all these different moments. Different Buddhas have different connections with us at different moments in our different lives. And when our minds ripen into experience, those ripenings are from maybe a million lifetimes ago. There was a guy in a market <laughs> and I said, you're a jerk to somebody. You know, It's not as cut and dry as we think it is for the Buddha to just come and help. So the Buddhas can only come and help if we have, you know, the reflection, like the pool of water can only, you know, the moon can only reflect if there's a pool of water to reflect it. And as many pools of water as there are, the moon can reflect that many times. Likewise, if you have the karm, if you have the conditions that are present within your mind to be able to connect with specific Buddhas, there's countless Buddhas, there's a lot of Buddhas. If your mind has that at that moment, ability to connect with a specific Buddha, the Buddha can emanate and help. But the Buddha can't just out of free will say, okay, I have no karmic way to help this being, but I'll break karma because the Buddha is under the control of karma as well, but just goes from good karma to good karma to good karma. Um, and that's why he or she produced has bliss, 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 no suffering, no suffering, no suffering, no suffering. Uh, and goes from a non-afflicted mind to a non-afflicted mind to a non-afflicted mind. If you have a non-afflicted mind that goes to a non-afflicted mind, then that non-afflicted mind can't create an, an, an inappropriate attention. So you go from non-afflicted mind to a non-afflicted mind. You have a non-inappropriate attention mind to a non-inappropriate attention mind. You have a non-afflicted mind that goes to a non-afflicted mind. You have a non-contaminated karmas that go from not to non-contaminated karmas. And you have an absence of samsara that goes from an absence of samsara to an absence of samsara. <laughs> Nirvana has a beginning, but has no end. That's the meaning of it. And I hope that this was helpful for you to understand what we're trying to do this evening. So you bring all sentient beings here. Now we're gonna imagine the merit field and the space in front of us. I like imagining the sentient beings first because I don't wanna be selfish in imagining I'm calling the merit field one by one and be like, okay, now that you're all here guys, wink, wink, let's call the other poor beings here into our practice and it's the Lam Rim it says it in a couple of different ways but for me the Lam Rim is a personal practice it, it, it's something that every moment of my life when I am not distracted I'm trying to implement in my little tiny bitty way that I can and then I'm going to be able to do it in a little tiny bit way better than I could you know, and then be better and better and better to the point of perfection to go through path of accumulation, preparation, seeing meditation and no more learning. Wow, we're so fortunate in those 37 aspects of enlightenment that we go through in those five different paths as we get through, you know, uh, our mess. So imagine that the Buddha who taught this, who came to our world 25, 2600 years ago out of love and compassion to show us exactly what we need to do to achieve the state that he has already achieved, a freedom from the afflictive obstructions, the obstructions to omniscience. So imagine that that Buddha, who whenever you call a Buddha, the Buddha arrives. Lama Tsongkhapa had this amazing ability to be able to, to call upon the Buddhas in the merit field would just kind of fall into place in the space in front of him. And he'd just say, hello, hi, oh, hello, hello to the 35 Buddhas. And this is happening to us as we call the merit field but unfortunately we have karma we have these obscurations we're not able to see them our, our karma doesn't allow us to see these beings we're calling them so they hear us they're omniscient they have you know they can, they're poor their hair can hear us <laughs> and know exactly what to do for us when we call them 
And we're creating that condition in our mind for them to help us when we call them. So we're all just trying to do smart work all the time and trying to pack as much virtue into each and every moment of our life so that we can get to Buddhahood as quickly as possible. This is how we're able to, you know, even if we look in the, the sutra vehicle, the perfection vehicle, or we look at the tantric vehicle, there are techniques to pack more positive to potential into each moment. And if you have 65 or 64 moments in a second or other, I mean, now there's like a lot of moment measurement going on. If you have all those to work with and you can get your mind concentrated enough to work within each of and every one of those, imagine if you could take those 64 and do 64 good things. And now you have another second to do another 64. You have 128 good things instead of two. This is how Tantra could compress, can compress things into making it so it's a swifter vehicle to the state of Buddhahood. This is how techniques within the Mahayana path allow you to move quicker towards certain realizations, how you're able to have joy that is even higher than some of the beings who are very realized in the individual liberation vehicle um, because of this compression of virtue. So who who came to show us this Buddha Shakyamuni? So imagine Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of us, so kind, looking into our eyes with that love and compassion that someone who cared about us more than anyone in the world would look into our eyes with. Think about when you've been Look into the eyes of His Holiness the Dalai Lama or your spiritual teachers, those gurus, those root lamas who cared for us so well. Think about when you looked into their eyes, that love you felt, that comfort, that care, that safety, that refuge you felt. And imagine that you're looking into the eyes of Buddha Shakyamuni and you're experiencing that same thing. And he's right there in front of you. And he's there right now, just like he was 2,600 years ago, just trying to get through to numbskulls like me and looking into my eyes with all oh, so much love and knowing just what to do for me. So I feel so safe that there's somebody who knows exactly what to do for me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to have doubt. I don't have to say, do you have my best interest in mind? Because I know the Buddha can only have my good and best interest in mind because the Buddha has abandoned all negativities and only has excellent qualities. So Buddha Shakyamuni appears in the space in front of us. Imagine His Holiness the Dalai Lama is on a very firm throne supported by eight snow lions, Vajra strong on a Vajra throne. It's immovable that, that he will remain with us for eons. Imagine His Holiness the Dalai Lama is there looking into our eyes in the same way. And now we start to imagine all of our lamas, our root lamas. Imagine Kensho Geshe Wandak Rinpoche. Imagine Geshe Lobsang Gompo. Imagining Demolocho Rinpoche, imagining Kensa Lobsan Yatso, imagining all of these holy beings, imagining uh, Geshe Dorje Damdula, and imagining Umzala Geshe Aga, and imagining Jeffrey Hopkins here in the space in front of us. Imagine all of these beings are here, right here. Now we have to think of, unfortunately, Jeffrey Hopkins on a lotus instead of on a throne. And there has been a shift, but there's not a shift in his presence. We need to think about this with, when we think about our lamas and recognize when they pass that we've only removed kind of our barriers to, to really being with them all of the time. And when we can start to look at it like this and see our sadness and see our this as a blessing and see us our mind knowing how to take the essence of this life and knowing our mind has recognized what the source of all of our good is, we then can actually use that kind of sadness, use that as the most powerful thing to cut the root of cyclic existence uh, once we know how to use it and see the emptiness of it, a action agent and object. So we see all of these kind lamas. Now we start to see all of the beings of, of the, the, the Nalanda tradition and so forth appearing in, in the space in front of us. All the beings of the profound view lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni I'm sorry, all the beings of the extensive deeds lineage passed down from Buddha. Sha I have to do it in that order because I'm like left, right in my mind and my visualization. You could do it either way. It's fine. <laughs> all the beings of the extensive deeds lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Maitreya and Asanga and Basubandhu and Dignaga and Dharmakirti and Vimukta Sena and Hari Bhadra and Shakya Prabha and Guna Prabha. 
and Lama Sir Limpa and Lord Atisha and, and Drone Tompa, imagining these holy beings of the profound view lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Manjushri and Nagarjuna and Buddha Palita and Arya Deva and Chandrakirti and Shanti Deva and Baba Vega and Chandrashita and Kamala Shila. All of these holy beings are appearing in the space in front of you. But then again, Lama Sir Limpa and Lord Atisha and Drone Tompa. Imagining the lineage of blessings passed down from Vajradhara, Saraha, Matripa, Tilopa, Naropa, uh, Lotsawa, Marpa, Jetsun, Milarepa, Jagam, Popa, all of these holy beings, Jagam, Popa, and his jeweled ornament uh, of liberation, this incredible Lam Rim text. And Lama Tsongkhapa said that there's no other emptiness to realize than the emptiness of the mind that, La that J. Milarepa realized. And we're so fortunate to have these teachings trickle into our minds so that we can realize the emptiness of our minds and we can mature our minds to the same state that Milarepa achieved, the complete Buddhahood in one lifetime. We have the same potential because our mind is empty of inherent existence and it can proliferate to the state of perfection. And we have these teachings that will allow it to happen. Imagine that Drone Tompa is passing down this incredible Lam Rim lineage to the, th the three old Kadampas. Imagine now that all the holy beings of the Nyingma, Padmasambhava, and Lonjempa, and Mipam, all of these beings are in the space in front of you. The beings of the Sakya tradition, Sakya Randawa, Sakya Pandita, Sacha and Konga Nimpo. Imagine the beings of the, the Kaju lineage, Jagam Pompa, and imagining all the Karmapas are there in the space in front of you. And the beings of the Galupa lineage, Jetson Kappa, and Kirtup Jay, and Joseph Jay, Penchen Sonan Japa, Basu Chuji Jetson, Janja Rupi Dorje, Gontu Jimmy Wampo, Jayan Sheba, Jet Sumpa, Pubajo, Seventh Al Lama. All of these holy beings are in the space in front of you. Now imagine the highest yoga tantra deities, yoga tantra deities, performance tantra deities, action tantra deities. Imagining all of the 35 Buddhas and the protector deities. These are all beings in the space in front of you. Imagine them in your own individual way, however you imagine them, but make sure you connect with these beings so that these beings can help you, can help me. This is why I do it, so that I can eventually understand the distinction between Baba Vega's view and Nagarjuna's view, Chandrakirti's view. They both interpret Nagarjuna. Why is Chandrakirti's view more subtle than Baba Vega? How do we negate Baba Vega's view? Kamala Shila's view, Chandrashita's view. How do we arrive at Arya Deva and Shanti Deva's view, Chandrakirti's view? We do so by connecting with these beings' texts and then being able to learn how to become liberated from the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience, to learn how to develop bodhicitta, to learn how to traverse the grounds and paths that have been presented by beings who came to appear to teach lower views of emptiness in terms of uh, they can be negated, but they came to teach those views in order to ripen sentient beings at their own individual individual levels. And the bodhicitta that we practice is a common, common kind of bodhicitta that we recognize, as, as it says in the Abhisamalankara, as the wish for perfect enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. So now we have every kind of being possible here, sentient beings and non-sentient beings, Buddhas and sentient beings. So I imagine my merit field as all Buddhas, some do, you know, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I choose in my practice to do all these beings are Buddhas, uh, but it's not necessary. Uh, and there are so many different ways to visualize the merit field. This is not my recipe for you. This is just me saying, I find this really important and when we look at the six preparations, it's something that the holy beings find very important. Uh, so it's something that I try to do if holy beings do it, because I would love to become a holy being, unlike the being that I am today. So we make that aspiration to become holy beings. May we become Buddhas for the sake of all sentient beings. but recognizing that we ourselves are empty of inherent existence. That wish is empty of inherent existence. The sentient beings are empty of inherent existence. And if we can recognize that bodhicitta whilst having the three spheres, it's really a, 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 the real deal, the pure kind of form of helping others. Uh, when we see you know, the, the levels of compassion, the pure forms of compassion are where we can see sentient beings' emptiness and impermanence while we're helping them. So fortunate to have these teachings, folks. Please, please practice because they work. 
So now that we have all beings in the universe here, let's recite the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but we know the explicit teaching here is the emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena, of self of persons and self of phenomena. Nothing exists right within the object from its own side, able to hold itself up. It's merely designated independence upon a collection that serves as its basis of designation, thought designation, thought designating a label onto that basis of designation that I'm going to say is flower over there, but there's nothing that can be findably flower from the side of the flower when we subject it to ultimate analysis. And this is what the Buddha came to tell us, that we cannot, when we, engage, when we subject things to ultimate analysis, we find that they don't exist from the side of the object. And then when we go back to, well, there's something over there, we have to come to the conclusion that there's a subjective designation happening onto an external collection. And this is the difference. The mind only would say there's nothing external. It's the same nature as the mind. And the, the middle way consequence school would say, no, there's stuff out there. Uh, it's just merely designated and agreed upon by your collective groups of ordinary world folk. Um, and, and the lack of inherent existence of every object that you're agreeing upon can be named as this, abides in every single object you're agreeing upon can be named this or that. And that lack of inherent existence shows you that there's no flower inherently existent over there, but there's a flower conventionally that can be labeled that is a dependent origination. And when you can see the dependent origination and the emptiness of inherent existence as one entity, as the same entity, different isolates, then Lama Tsongkhapa says that you get it. If you can posit cause and effect and karma still working while it being empty of inherent existence, then you understand what the emptiness of the Lord Buddha was trying to get at. And implicitly, this is talking about the five paths and the 10 grounds, you know, that we have to go through in order to generate the mind that aspires to enlightenment in the path of accumulation. And we have the small, medium, and great level. And then we have the four levels of the path of preparation. We have heat, peak, patience, and the, the supreme of phenomena, you know, where we start to have this union of calm abiding and special insight. And we become more and more subtly able to have the generic image just wiped out to the point where there is a non-duality of subject and object in a direct experience of emptiness done by a yogic direct perceiver. And then one achieves the path of seeing, the uninterrupted path and the path of release of the path of seeing and enters the first bodhisattva ground and then moves onto the path of meditation and gets rid of the great of the great afflictions uh, onto, onto the second bodhisattva ground on the path of meditation and then moves through those bodhisattva grounds, getting rid of the innate afflictions to the point of being able to eventually get rid of all of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience. So, uh, and that would be called no more learning, bodhisoha. So uh, this is what the sutra is about. The sutra of the heart of transcendent knowledge. Thus have I heard once the blessed one was dwelling in Rajagriya at Bulger Peak Mountain together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the blessed one entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination. At the same time, noble Abhikadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, while practicing the profound Prajnaparamita saw in this way, he saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to noble Abhikadeshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita address? in this way, noble Abhagateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva said to Venerable Shariputra, O oh, Shariputra, son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice a profound Prajaparamita, should see in this way, seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Form is emptiness, emptiness also is form. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no purity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch. No dharmas, no eye, datu, no mind, datu, no datu of dharmas, no mind, consciousness, datu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance, up to old age and death. No end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend. 
they transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable true complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajaparamita, the path of accumulation, the mantra of great insight, the path of preparation, the unsurpassed mantra, the path of seeing, the unequaled mantra, the path of meditation, the mantra that calms all suffering, the path of no more learning, learning should be known as truth since there is no deception. Prajaparamita mantra is said in this way. Teata om gate gate paragate parasangati bodhisoha. The Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised Noble Abhikateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son and noble family. Thus it is, O son and noble family. Thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Abhikateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Gala jibe ne jo damba ne nguje du ju ngai du do jen du baba lama yi bu jin zi ne zun gan jo zo la jo zi lo aga zo ma ri jo zan do zo And we'll make a mandal offering as a request for teaching. And remember that we're offering this perfect, beautiful universe to all the Buddhists in this merit field that we just envision. Imagine that all the sentient beings are making this offering. And also imagine it within this offering that all sentient beings are just full of joy, because uh, this is what the is another offering. And imagine that in this is all of our practice that we're offering to the Buddhas. So however you can do that in your mind, just imagine that this perfect mandala includes your practice. Fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. All sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas High, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready. A shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. Sanye jalan zaji jalan la janju badu dani jazu ji dagi juche ji pe sonan ji jala benji sanje du ba jo sanje jalan zaji jalan la janju badu dani jazu ji dagi juche ji pe sonan ji jala benji sanje du ba jo sanje jalan zaji jalan la janju badu dani jazu ji dagi juche ji pe sonan ji jala benji sanje du ba jo Enthused by great compassion, you taught the immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha, Gautama, I pay obeisance. From Sachin Kunga Nimpos, parting from the four attachments. If you are attached to this life, you are not a spiritual practitioner. If you are attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. All right. So I'm going to get back to a couple stanzas of the foundation of all good qualities. And then just a couple, because uh, I'm going back through it a little bit. I know that we were at the Union of Calm Abiding and Special Insight a ways back, but I felt like I wanted to go back through uh, the parts in the beginning a little bit as I was studying the... Um, uh, huh. Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life with uh, Umzala Aga. I'm taking classes almost every day with him. I feel so fortunate. I'm finding things that are just so appropriate. And then there's quotes from His Holiness in this book that we're studying together. It's a big 600-page book in Tibetan uh, that then send me to all these different texts. Um, and one of the texts that I've read to you before from Pabunga Rinpoche, the on impermanence we're going to read tonight uh, attached to this a little bit but i'll get to maybe we will we may not you know me you know i'll start talking and won't get to it but 
So we begin with the source of all my good and uh, Anila, uh, uh, who was who was on, uh, was involved with you know making this possible. So we feel really fortunate. I don't believe she's on anymore. But the source of all my good, the source of all my good is my kind Lama, my Lord. Bless me first to see that taking myself to him in the proper way is the very root of the path and grant me then to serve and follow him with all my strength or reverence. And you can say him or her, but Lama Tsongkhapa's teachers were males and this was written by Lama Tsongkhapa. So this is the reasoning why it says that. But we have, you know, I, I have female teachers. Uh, so, uh, you know, and in these times we have Geshe Ma's, uh, we have highly realized yoginis, uh, and our teachers don't have to be male or female, you know, one or the other. They can be both or just one. So let's just keep an open mind and recognize all we need is somebody qualified who has the 10 qualities presented in the Mahayana Sutra Alamkara by Lord Matreya that a teacher should have, or the Tantra requested by Sabahu, where we have all of those qualities that are talked about. And Atisha talked about qualities also. Um, so this is what we do when we look for a teacher. Bless me to realize that excellent life of leisure I found just this once is ever so hard to find and ever so hard and valuable. Grant me then to wish and never stop to wish that I could take its essence night and day, that I could take its essence in such a way that I could compress each moment into the most virtuous moment possible so I can stop having to have this awful existence where I have the suffering of suffering, suffering of change and the pervasive compounded suffering that makes me get to have all of it. Um, so I'm being forced into these aggregates over and over and over and over again because of contaminated karmas, afflictions in their seeds, and which come from the self-grasping ignorance, which is the true origin of suffering that we must abandon by recognizing the non-duality uh, of, of subject and, and object, by realizing the union of bliss and emptiness, hopefully. Uh, so it's ever so hard to find. This basis that I have is ever so hard to find. We look at it because the causes for making it are hard. We have to have ethical discipline. And then we have to have the practice of the other six perfections. And we have to have stainless aspirations. So hard to get this basis. And the examples of how hard it is to get, we just learned about in Shanti Deva's Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. We have this blind sea turtle every hundred years. Uh, sometimes they say a thousand, depends on the quote. Hundred years, blind sea turtle in the vast ocean. Ocean's rough you know, came up every hundred years. And on top of this rough ocean, there was a yoke, the thing that kind of goes around a, a cow, uh, you know, just figure like a thing like this, <laughs> you know, it was floating in the whole ocean. You know, what it would be like if that blind sea turtle came up and were able to, what are the chances he's going to, you know, land in there? You know, the Buddhas have this hook uh, to be able to hook us and help us, but we have to have an eyelid. That eyelet's so rare. Right now we have an eyelet that can hook onto. We have this human basis. And the and this blind sea turtle example is, is kind of rough on how we came about it. And they say that the number of beings who will go from the higher realms to the lower realms are like atoms in the universe. And the ones that will go from the higher realms to the higher realms are like the atoms on a fingernail or between two fingers. And the beings that will go from the lower realms to the lower realms are like the atoms in a universe. And the beings that will go from the lower realms to the higher realms are like the atoms on a finger or between our fingers. Wow, that's a big difference. That's why it's so hard to find. Look at these examples that the Buddha gave, not in Jeff Allen, the Buddha gave these examples. And we see just how it's ever so hard to find, ever so difficult uh, because we need these kind of difficult causes made and then the numbers of beings in the lower realms are most, and the number of beings in the higher realms are least. Uh, and we just do some math and we see we better get cracking. And how do we take essence of this life? We engage in the practice for the beings of three capacities, small, medium, and great capacity. My body and the life in it are fleeting in the bubbles, of, like the bubbles in the sea froth will wave. Bless me first thus to recall the death that will destroy me soon. We look at the, not, the three roots and nine reasons. Death will come and nothing can stop it. We don't know when it's going to occur and nothing can help us but Dharma. You know, death will come to everybody. You know, the life is always being subtracted from and never added to, and we have no time to practice Dharma. We don't know when we're going to die. It's not fixed in Jamba Viva. You know, that, and the causes for death are a lot more than the causes for life. And this body is so insignificant and our friends can't help. 
Our material things can't help. This body can't help. And based on those nine reasons, we conclude the only thing that can help is dharma. Because at the time of death, one projecting karma is going to make a life for us. Are we ready to jump you know, from this life to the next? Or are we going to be thrown by our afflictions into a lower realm? We got to know. We know our own minds. We know when we get disturbed how our minds operate. And when we have the most disturbance we can ever have at the time of our death, our action, our activities all of, throughout our day can kind of give us an idea what it'll be like. So it's time for us to start practicing and help me find sure knowledge that after I've died, the things I've done, the white or black and what those deeds bring to me follow always close behind as certain as my shadow. The Dharmapada, the sayings of Lord Buddha, the oldest Pali text say, mind is the chief and precedes them all. If within pure mind, one acts or speaks, miseries follow like a cart following the ox. Mind is the chief and precedes them all. If with pure mind, one acts or speaks, happiness follows like a shadow and never leaves. And here's another translation by Christopher Carter Sanderson, where he did an updated kind of new modern translation using modern examples uh, and modern slang to try to see if it could help us, you know, you know, there's a different wrench for every nut, right? Different sizes. So, you know, different translations can help us if they're said in different ways. The Buddha talked in all different kinds of ways. So he says it like this, the mind gives life shape. What will be what we think. Thoughts pull suffering like engines pull cars. Our minds give life shape. We are as we think. Good brings joy. Ill thinking brings misery. And then another from the third chapter, I saw this, uh, chapter three, stanza three, it's called chapter three. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a scholar of the Dharmapada. I just like it. People who can tell their thoughts where to go in a way that really sticks the damn things to where they're told, these folks escape death. Wow, that's awesome, right? Wisdom can't live in a troubled mind. The mind loves to wander. It's hard to teach. To the well-trained minds comes joy and wellness. Wise minds can make good choices for thought. Yes, to the well-trained mind come joy and wellness. So we see that the Buddha was just trying to get us to train our mind, to see that if we really, really want to experience eternal bliss and perfect love, power, compassion, skillful means, wisdom, then it's going to be done, the work, that's going to be done is on our mind. Uh, it's not on external things. External things is what our minds react to. External things like sentient beings are the things that our mind develops compassion in relation to. But it's our mind developing the compassion. It's our mind developing the wisdom. It's our mind recognizing that that chair over there is empty of inherent existence while still being able to conventionally be a chair and make sense to be something that I can sit in but also makes sense to my dog who thinks that the leg of it just might be a dog toy. <laughs> In the case of many of our chairs when they were puppies. So we'll leave that at that. Uh, but it says, and what those deeds will bring to me follow always close behind as certain as my shadow. Grant me the ever to be careful to stop the slightest wrongs, the many wrongs we do and try to carry out instead each and every good of the many that we may. So we see that, I won't get to Pabunka Rinpoche's text tonight, I'll do it next week. We see that, because uh, there's something else I wanna focus on. We see that our minds uh, have to be changed. Our minds dwell in the state of delusion. And Lama Tsongkhapa is illuminating the intent, which is a, a commentary, uh, and uh, Tupton Jimba has translated this. We're so lucky, the Umagumba Rapsel. It's a Umajupi uh, Delpa. It's the commentary on, uh, Chandrakirti's uh, supplement to the middle way or other translations, entrance to the middle way. And we find uh, a really amazing quote throughout this book. But where is the problem lying? The problem at the end of the day is the self-grasping ignorance. And many other traditions will say, oh, well, we can just get rid of attachment or attachment to attachment. We just have to kind of look at the downfalls of attachment. We have to wear out karmas only somehow. Uh, and if we wear out karmas, then we can be liberated. But what the Buddha came to tell us is, is that our mind 
has this problem that sees things as in, it believes things are inherently existent and experiences them from an appearance perspective all through our senses as being inherently existent. And this is what causes us then to overvalue things, have inappropriate attention that says, that's pleasant, that's not pleasant. And then when we see something pleasant, we become attached. When we see something unpleasant, we wanna punch it. <laughs> and we see something neutral, we're ready to, at any moment, just depending on our whims to get ready to punch it or love it. <laughs> really, we we have our minds that are so screwed up and then we create karma. So if we don't get rid of the thing that keeps creating the karma, even if we get rid of karma, we're going to create more karma. And it says that right in the Lam Rim Chemo when we look at the karma and affliction section, uh, that, you know, how they arise, you know, the, the afflictions aren't there. The karma, even if you still have karma to be reborn in a lower realm, the afflictions aren't there. There's nothing to, to make it to make it happen. If there's no attachment, you don't have anything that gives rise to the grasping and in a potential existence. So, so what do we need to fix? So in the Arya Davis 400 verses, this is in the two truths section of the sixth ground in, Chan, in uh, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary on Chandrakirti's supplement to the middle way as, as Jeffrey Hopkins translates the name or entrance to the middle way. Um, so Arya Davis 400 verses says, just like the body faculty in the entire body. So the body faculty is it runs throughout the body. You know, the body sense power runs throughout the body. Like when we go to touch something here, we can feel it. We touch something here, we can feel it. And something here, we can feel it. Touch our eye, smash our eye. That, that sense, that power, that calm runs throughout the whole body. Delusion to, resides in all of the afflictions. So no matter how much you have, you suppress gross afflictions, if you haven't gotten rid of the subtle one, which is the self-grasping ignorance, grasping at uh, the self of person and phenomena as being inherently existent, you'll have inappropriate attention. And that inappropriate attention will posit things as having pleasure or not pleasure. And then that'll give rise to a new attachment to something else, even if you've suppressed it in relation to another thing. And this is what Dharmakirti goes over and over in the second chapter of the Pramana Vartika Karika. So here, Chandrakirti's commentary on these lines, Chandrakirti's clear words uh, says that, so Chandrakirti's clear words is his auto commentary, his own commentary on his text, The Entrance to the Middle Way. So it's a big thing in the Nalanda tradition to be like, oh, let me clarify what I was trying to say. <laughs> So it gives you like a second shot, a second chance to make it so that more beings are able to understand it. it gives you it. And it isn't because, you know, there's something what it wasn't enough. It's because Chandrakirti says, oh, let me clarify it more for the sake of more beings who maybe couldn't see it at this subtle level. Uh, and then Lama Tsongkhapa comes around and says, hey, I'm going to help you clarify it even more. And I'm going to use his Kado commentary and the root text. And this root text, it, the is really a commentary on the root wisdom, the Muya Madhyamika Karika by Nagarjuna. So when we read this text, the illuminating the intent, the Uma Gombarapsal, we're looking at Buddha's words, Buddha Shakyamuni, and then we're looking at it trickling down, and then we're looking at Nagarjuna's Muya Madhyamika Karika, the root wisdom text, the uh, the root wisdom text, and then we're looking at Chandrakirti's entrance to the middle way. What's the, and I got to stop saying way because that's taken out of the Hopkins vocabulary. We're only saying entrance to the middle now. So the entrance to the middle or supplement to the middle is a commentary on Nagarjuna's Mulya Madhyamika Karika. And then Chandrakirti's clear words is an auto commentary on his own commentary on Nagarjuna's Mulya Madhyamika Karika. And then Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary is a commentary on all of it. We're so fortunate that these beings said, hey, there's people who aren't as smart, kind of like Jeff, who will need more explanation. But if we give it to him, he's going to eventually get emptiness. Wow, I'll eventually get emptiness because this stuff has been spoon fed to us. Arya Nagarjuna says, and see if this tallies with what I'm talking about. Ceasing of karma and afflictions is nirvana. Okay, so we see that samsara, comes about because contaminated karmas, contaminated karmas come about because of afflictions. 
ceasing of karma and afflictions is nirvana. Karma and afflictions come about through conceptuality, inappropriate attention. It comes about from elaboration, self-grasping ignorance. Elaboration cease into ignorance. And this is from, uh, I think, the 18th chapter of the Molya Madhyamika Karika, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so here, in Chandrakirti's auto-commentary, Lama Tsongkhapa is pointing out something awesome. Delusion. Okay, so Arya Deva says delusion resides in all of our afflictions. Chandrakirti says here, delusion refers to ignorance. For it apprehend, apprehends things as real, as such, it operates by way of exaggerating, superimposing, truly existent natures upon things. Superimposing, putting something that's not there, putting a truly existent nature on myself, self of person and phenomena, putting a truly existent findable nature there that's not findable. So we believe something that doesn't exist exists. That's our premise. Something that's not real is real. And then attachment and so on also operate by thoroughly, thoroughly attributing qualities of attractiveness, pleasantness, or unattractiveness upon the nature of things imputed by the delusion. So now you say these things, you superimpose something on an object that doesn't have from its own side what you think that it does. You think that it inherently has a quality about it that you're ready to discover. And then from that delusion, more delusions happen, such as attachment and, and, and anger. And why do they happen? Because an inappropriate attention has assigned attractiveness or unattractiveness, and then you become drawn or repelled. And as such, they don't, inter and they don't operate independently of delusion. Your attachment, your pride, your discursiveness, your 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 aversion, your your hatred, you know, your frustrations. Just you come up with your own mix of mess. You know, all of these have within it the self-grasping ignorance as its root, saying, "Yeah, it makes sense to be attached to this because it inherently exists." And it not only I think that it does; it sure looks like it with my eyes. My eyes see them mistakenly as inherently existent. Weird, right? It's weird. My eyes are seeing things inherently existent. Blows my mind every time. Furthermore, they are contingent on delusion, and that delusion is the primary factor. So we must have the wisdom arisen from hearing in relation to the emptiness, and the wisdom arisen from contemplation in relation to emptiness, and the wisdom arisen from meditation in relation to emptiness. It's the only liberating path. All of the other paths are ripening paths that help us move boulders out of the way. When we're walking towards this idea of seeing emptiness directly, all of these ideas of renunciation and bodhicitta and these kind of concentrations that, you know, aren't the, you know, the one that's seeing emptiness directly, they're all working at a conventional level. They're not apprehending ultimate reality as such, usually. Uh, and they're moving boulders out of the way to be able to move the generic in image, the shit, the the donshi out of the way that one is seeing as their his or her reference for emptiness of inherent existence. Even the yogi who's having a union of calm abiding and special insights still mistaken with re respect to the object of appearance because the actual generic image appears to be the realization of emptiness and and one is actually getting to emptiness through an image and when you have a yogic direct perception that generic image is no longer there so that one has to get rid of delusion in stages but the only way that happens is if you know what the object of negation is what is the you know what is it that you have to stop the gotcha what is the object of negation? You have a denji, you know, you have a daji, you have a gacha. And what is it about the, you know, this thing, the, the yule and the yule chen, you know, what's going on between the subject and object? You know, is it coming from the object, from the yule, or is it coming from the subject, the yule chen? And when we start to look at Madhyamaka, we see it. And, we, and even when we look at the Chittamantran view, we, we see this from the subject, from the subject, 
Uh, and we have to refine it to the point where it's the accurate point about the subject. It says, uh, and I'll give you some of Tsongkhapa's commentary on it. Up to the end of the first sentence shows that delusion here refers to grasping at true existence. And hypothetical uh, synonyms of true existence are true establishment, uh, inherent existence, intrinsic existence, existing right within the object, sometimes translated as objective existence, existing by way of its own character, existing by way of its own defining characteristics, believing that the object has defining characteristics from its own side that establish it as something that can be found from its side. This is These are all, for Madhyamaka Prasangika, these are all hypothetical synonyms. Uh, and the emptiness of inherent existence, the emptiness of true existence, uh, uh, the emptiness of objective existence, the emptiness of the object existing right within itself. These are all synonyms. Now, for Madhyamaka Prasangika and Madhyamaka Svatantrika, we look at Madhyamaka Svatantrika, these are not synonyms because true existence and inherent existence are not synonyms because that school still believes in inherent existence, believe it or not. You think the middle way uh, or the middle wouldn't, but there is a division of middle that misses it a little. The statement that attachment and so on do not operate independently of delusion indicates they that they function in association with delusion, not divorced of it. The reason for this is presented in the pas passage that reads, attachment and so on up to imputed by delusion. Since attractive and unattractive qualities are superimposed by incorrect mentation, which is in fact a cause of attachment and aversion, the passage here does not have identify the mode of apprehension of attachment and aversion themselves. Therefore, the phrase upon the nature of things imputed by delusion is to be understood to mean that attachment and aversion operate on the basis of superimposing intrinsically existent qualities of attractiveness and unattractiveness. So we see the object to intrinsically exist and then we see it to intrinsically be attractive. What a mess. And it appears that way. And we then decide it appears inherently existent and then we decide, oh, wow, that's really attractive. And then it, we think it's appearing attractive somehow because we've convinced it. What a wreck. And it doesn't have any quality of that. It can't possibly have any quality of that. Prove it. My dog thinks my shoe's a toy. And she's right in her realm because it works that way. This, this is incredible. We have this knowledge. I think I'm out of time. I want to say thank you all for listening. I wanted to go go kind of cruise tonight. I want to cruise. Sometimes I like to go slow. <laughs> tonight, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to cruise. So I hope that you are all cruising alongside me. Uh, and as we do this more and more and more, I think you'll see repetitive topics. And we can all kind of cruise together and just find this kind of joyous cruise. Uh, because I love this so much. This isn't something that I put on, uh, you know, just for you once a week. I take multiple classes a day and I can sit in them and really, I and, and Lori can tell you that this is true. Um, I'm not a bodhisattva, nor do I have renunciation or shamata, shamata or any of these great things. I haven't seen emptiness. But I have this joy about the Dharma that allows me to sit in a three-hour class with Geshe Dorje Damdu realize I'm due because the class was supposed to be an hour and a half. It went an hour and a half over. I go 10 minutes over and I feel like I've done some grave misdeed. <laughs> Dorje Damdu actually went an hour and 45 minutes over. I had to leave 15 minutes early. I left at three hours. It went on for three hours and 15 minutes. To be able to then jump on class with Umzala Aga for an hour and a half on Shanti Deva's guide. So that's three, four and a half hours of class and I only ended it because we had some other things like life stuff that had to be done. I said to Umzla, okay, uh, I believe, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, we, we, he knew that I had just been in a three hour class. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would have been willing to keep going because this is like nectar. Uh, once you start to see this is the only solution, it becomes nectar. It becomes the greatest song you ever heard in your life. And you turn on another song, it's the most boring thing you've ever heard in your life. Really, not kidding. And I'm a musician. I used to have music plumping through my blood. I know more words to songs. If you turn on the radio 
and it's something like 90s, 70s, 80s, and it was out. I can sing every word, and I loved it that much. And now I turn it on, and it sounds so boring compared to, you know, what I just read to you. And it's not because I'm so evolved. It's because I have evolved. And that's what proliferating Buddha nature is about. And if we believe that this is possible, then this gives us like kind of the reason to do it. And if we don't have any reason to do it, we'll just sputter out or we'll just kind of listen. Or we'll think it's cool so we can tell people we're Buddhist or talk about it in a coffee shop, but it won't change our minds. And if we'll talk about it in a coffee shop and people will be like, yeah, but he's such a jerk and has absolutely no difference than he was 20 years ago. So why would I ever listen to that? Fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I have collected for the benefit of the teachings of all sentient beings, in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Ozandrapa, to shine forever. Through this virtuous dedication and all the virtues created here, may we swiftly connect with all of our lamas who have appeared to pass uh, away like uh, Kensu Geshe Wanda Rinpoche and, and again, Nenden Jambel Drapala, uh, Professor Jeffrey Hopkins, may we quickly reunite. I send forth this jewel mandala to you, precious guru. Any mistakes that I've made, may they be purified. Om Benzo Sato Samayam and Abulai Benzo Sato Zeno Vajita Dida Meva, Sudagaya Meva, Zubagaya Meva, Anurag Meva, Zavazidi Meva, Rajat Savakama Suchi Meki Jam Shri Ankuru Hum, Ha 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 Ho, Bhagavan, Zavatata Kata, Benzo Mamai Mungo, Benzo Baba, Maha Samaya Sapa, Ha Hum Ve. May we be protected by Paul and Lamo, the wrathful emanation of Tara, who's always with us, who will promise to protect the Dharma. Okay, I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well, with whatever dedication is praise is supreme. By all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. And a long life prayer for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. May we have no obstacles to him. To may we have all of, all of our obstacles removed, so that His Holiness can walk right up to us. Because His Holiness, the Buddha of Compassion, has no problem walking. It's our obstacles that that al don't allow us to see Him walk right up to us. Don't allow us to have Him right in here in the room with us, teaching us the truth of suchness. Uh, that's why we have to purify our minds to be able to succeed the whole way. I pray. In the pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness, all powerful Abhagateshvara, Tenzin Jatso, may you stand to samsara's end. Long re ra we go we shin don dear, ben don de wa ma lu, jung we ne jen re zi wan den zin. Yatso yi jabe zide padu de yoji. And a prayer of supplication to Namgyal Kensar Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, my best friend I ever had, and also the just the person who knew exactly how to teach me, who knew my recipe knew what to pull out of the pharmacy to give me. A complex yogi poses as a simple monk. Homage to Kensar Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, our precious spiritual friend who is inseparable from Arya Tara. I fully prostrate covering as many atoms of the earth as possible to your pure body, speech, mind, and enlightened activities. I offer to you drinking water, bathing water, flowers, incense, candles, scented water, Food and music purified by Om 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 Om. The rarity of having one million wish fulfilling gems is a common occurrence compared to meeting with a holy teacher like you who placed the complete path to Buddhahood in our childlike hands. Just like a teacher who came to Tibet with a lamp to dispel the darkness of ignorance, you kind abbot arrived in the West with a lineage purer than a diamond and begged us never to be satisfied with partial instructions. And the teachings of the extensive deeds and profound view lineages flowed from your lips like nectar for our ears that elucidated the teachings of three capacities. Now that sound has stopped. All composite things are impermanent. You told us that all of your teachers passed away and understood the sadness, entreating us to continue our studies. The Buddha does not wash away the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their miseries by his hands. His spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. 
We are not prepared to take this difficult journey to the highest goodness of Buddhahood without your continued guidance. The sadness in our hearts would be too overwhelming. May you swiftly return to this world and take care of us in all of our lives, wherever we may be, never leaving our hearts and crowns. May all sentient beings perfectly realize renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness so that they know who you really are. And may Geshe Lobsang Gompo Rinpoche, who was so important to my education, so important to teach me about debate and teach me how to understand how to analyze philosophy in a subtler way. Uh, may Geshe Lobsang Gompo please, please come back to this world and may I reunite with him swiftly because he was so skilled in instruction. He was Kenser Geshe Wandok's student, although only a couple years younger. And wow, he was a, an incredible discipline master of Drepung Losaling Monastic University. And he passed away, unfortunately, after he was at our center and moved back to India to take care of his students, knowing that his life would be shortened by doing so. A great bodhisattva. Thank you so much for listening and please become great bodhisattvas. See you, everybody. I hope you have a great week.